Wow, what a day, what a day. We are so glad that you are here with us on this Resurrection Sunday, and we are here to celebrate and to lift up the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, just as we've done all weekend long. It's been an amazing weekend. We're glad that you have joined us. And uh, listen, 2,000 years ago, we realized most of the time, good news doesn't come from a graveyard, but 2,000 years ago, it did. Amen, that Jesus rose from the grave and out of the tomb, and death or the tomb could not hold Jesus back because of his great and almighty love for you and for me. I'm not sure what comes to mind as you think about the word love. I'm sure many things do, but um, did you ever have a crush in elementary school? How many of you had a crush in elementary school? Yes. Uh, About a quarter of you did. I'm sorry for the rest of you, but that's all right. But uh, some of you did, and you understand that uh, there's a protocol to elementary school love, isn't there? There there really is. For instance, if you love someone, you don't go directly to them. That's too simple and easy. There's a protocol to loving somebody in elementary school. You write a note, right? Not just any note, but you write a particular note. You, you take your time writing this note, and it's usually typically a series of three questions, isn't there? Three questions that come to mind. The first one is, do you like me? Yes, no, maybe, circle one. <laughs> it progresses. Question number two, do you love me? Yes, no, maybe, circle one, right? And then you come to the last one, will you be my girlfriend, boyfriend, yes, no, maybe, circle one. How many of you did that? Yes, you, you wrote the note, you passed the note, but how many of you know you didn't actually take this note? You had somebody deliver it to the one you loved. Come on, you got a friend, right? Can you go and pass this note on behalf to the one I really love? How many of you know that elementary school love is not real love, really. In fact, as you get older, you realize elementary school love will not suffice for mature love or mature relationships. A relationship, and we see that in a man's job, is to initiate, and it's a woman's job to respond. Isn't that true? That really is true. Man's job to initiate, woman's job is to respond. So girls, ladies in the house, are you with me? Can I hear you today? Yes? Okay. Listen, girls, you make that man do some work to get you. You don't make it easy. Are you you with me? You don't make it easy. You make that man work for it because the Bible says this, he who finds a wife finds a good thing. So you make him work for it. Are you with me? You make that man, that boy, work for it. A love note will not cut it for something more serious. Real love means to step out. It means to risk it all. And as you learn more about God, it's important to know the role that God has in our world and in our life. God is the initiator, and you and I are the responders. God didn't shout from heaven, he didn't send a love note, but he sent Jesus Christ in the form of flesh. I just want to know, is anybody grateful knowing that when we couldn't get to God, that God came to us? How many of you are grateful for that message, amen? How many of you are thankful for that news today, that God pursues you and I, because he is the initiator? That's what he was created to do. He's initiated something in us that deserves a response And you are the one that God loves. And I want us for just a moment, would you turn to the person next to you and would you tell them you are the one God loves? Come on, do it right now. You are the one. You are the one. You may not even know them, but you just say you're the one that God loves. You know, for most of us, we are so obsessed over how much we love God. How much more that we can do for God? And it's become very apparent to me that those that were closest to Jesus in the Bible, it wasn't their love for God, but God's love for them. 
Everything that you and I do is called out in our life to respond to God and what he has done for us. You know, and it seems like, you know, many times the closer we get to Jesus that our performance and our deeds, our do's and our don'ts don't preoccupy our minds as much as, oh, how he loves you and me. You ever heard the scripture verse John 3, 16? How many of you have heard of that one? Yeah, we've heard it. Tim Tebow did not write that. He just made it popular. John 3, 16, he's only... Uh, telling us what Jesus has already told us in his word of John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And it goes on, and we're going to get to that in just a moment. But how many of you know that you and I live so often for the world so loved God that he gave his only begotten son? If I, if I could just get God to love me and love me more, if he'll bless me, you know, and, and just more, if I can do this for him, and, and this tends to be our focus on loving God. It really does most of the time. But I wanted you to know this. This book is not about you loving God, but this book is about God loving you. God loves you first. Before we did anything, and that's an amazing word, that God so loved the world and you go back and you see, wow, the whole Bible is about God loving us. It starts off with God in Genesis chapter 1 in verse 1. It says, in the beginning, who? God, right? Anybody have an issue with that? Well, that's not a very good introduction. It's not a great introduction. Can we get some context here, God? God? Can we get an explanation of what's happened? Where did God come from? Where did you come from, God? It infers that God was there before the beginning. That, that God began the beginning. God is first. God is the initiator. He is preeminent. He is prominent. And he is the great initiator. And all of our lives is a response to who God is as the initiator. That God came to you and chose you. That's the theme of this book. 66 books of the Bible that God so loved us that he sent Jesus Christ. God so loved the world, and all of our life is a response to that. Have you ever considered how crazy and illogical and ridiculous John 3.16 is? It doesn't even make sense, really. Really, somebody would do that for us, and uh, God so loves super bad, sketchy people, Right? just like us, and, and he, he, he loves good people like there really is good people. Like, yeah, God loves bad people a lot. John 3.16, 3, God so loved. You ever met anybody with the so loves? I mean, the so loves. I remember growing up when I was younger, my mom and dad came to my basketball games, my soccer games, and I remember hearing them cheer me on, and even when I couldn't see them, my dad had this this really loud whistle, and I could hear him wherever he was at in the stadium. I just knew that he was there. I knew his whistle. I knew that he was there, and they're cheering me on. They're cheering me on when I'm winning in there, and, and I, that's the so loves. And, and I remember one time in soccer, I always wanted to do a head ball off a kicker and into the goal, and one day we had a corner kick, and part of my team, teammate was out there, kicked the ball, came, I headed it just right, and the goalie couldn't even touch it, score. And I was so excited. I remember I felt so loved. I pulled my T-shirt above my head. Ah, I am so loved. This is so amazing. I can hear my parents. We have the case of the so loves for our kids, don't we? And I saw that in my own life. So love. So love. So love is kind of, man, it's so crazy so crazy and stupid that you don't even care. That you're saying, hey, that's my baby, that's my boy, that's my girl, they're out there, and you're just cheering them on. It, it took him 20 swings on a ball that was stationary, but that's my boy. I love him, right? True. It doesn't matter. They're your children. You love them no matter what. They could run, run the wrong way. It doesn't matter. You so love them. God doesn't just love, he so loves. It's a degree of intensity that you and I don't have, but a degree of intensity that he has 
towards us that is actively pursuing us. God didn't just love. He so loves. God couldn't even help himself. God won't stop loving you ever. God does not have love. God does not do love. God does not feel love. God is love. He is the personification of love. God always acts consistently in content with his character because it's who he is. In other words, God cannot deny himself. God cannot help himself. He is crazy about you today. Everywhere you go, he goes. That's how much God loves you. He so loves. You know, God loves people who will never, ever love him back. In pop culture, they have a thing called a groupie. You ever heard of a groupie? Groupie, yeah. We might have some here. But in the first, somebody who's obsessed with an artist or an entertainer, they go everywhere they go. You ever talk to a groupie? Oh, I'm going to marry him. What? I'm going to marry her. No, you're not. That's crazy talk. Like, for instance, if my baby girl said, I want to marry Justin Bieber, I would sit down my daughter and say, baby girl, you don't want to marry Justin Bieber. First of all, he's already married, but he doesn't love you. He doesn't love you. And I would be a good dad because I'm trying to save her from this situation where her love was never reciprocated. You ever thought of, you could just sit down with God and you look at this crazy context of John 3, 16, and you're like, what in the world? God, God, wait a minute, we need to sit down and talk about this thing that you have love for us. God, this is not going to be good for you. God, loving these people is not going to be good for you because they don't love you. Do you did you know that? Oh, you, you do know that? Oh, man, this is, this is worse than I thought, God. We need to talk about this. You talk about a groupie. One scripture says, while we sleep, God watches over us. That's crazy love. He so loves, and so many times we're living for things that never reciprocate our love. In the world that we live in, have you ever continued to do the things you know you shouldn't be doing? Oh, yeah. But you did them anyways? Mm-hmm. And you finally get to the point where you say, God, you cannot keep loving me like this because, God, I don't love you the same way that you love me. And so this is terrible. And sometimes it feels like a one-way street. And we have to know that in Jesus, he cannot deny us as the Father. He cannot deny us because he cannot deny himself for your life and my life, the Bible says, is hidden in Jesus Christ. So the moment you believed in Jesus, you and I are a new creation and that's why we love Easter for many reasons that this weekend is about fresh starts and new beginnings because that's what the cross, his death, his burial, and his resurrection is all about. That no matter what you have done or where you come from, that you and I can get a new beginning in Jesus today. That's great news. I don't know about you. Amen. That's great news. That's great news. You are the one he so loves. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. This whole book is about love in there. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved who? Us. When we didn't love him, when we didn't even know that he existed, he sent his son to take our punishment, to take our place, and to take the wrath that was stored up for us and towards us. And this is amazing. So here you have Passover in the Gospel of John, and John writes, chapter 13 and verse 1, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him, meaning that he knew that his days on this earth were very short, and he was going to leave this world and go to the Father, and he said this, having loved his own who were in the world, here it is, he loved them to the very end. John wants us to know that there is an endless love waiting for us. He loved them to the very end. That's how John describes the last days and the last hours of Jesus upon this earth. This is how John saw it. He saw Jesus being brutalized, tormented, tortured, shamed, ridiculed. And that is what he concluded as he saw Jesus carry the cross. And let me tell you something today. There's no other world religion or small g God that has ever done that for you and me, but Jesus Christ in him and him alone. 
he is worth giving your life to. He loved them to the very end, and he knew that they did not love him to the very end. It's an interesting statement. He loved them to the end because the end of love is endless. He loved them to the end, but they didn't know the end was just the beginning. He loved them to the end even when they thought the story was finished, that it had just gotten started. See, if Jesus' story had ended at the cross, he would have loved them to the end, but he rose from the grave from the dead, so love has conquered death. Love is more powerful than death. Love is more powerful than death today. While you and I slept in our beds last night in Sri Lanka, over 160 people were killed, most of which were Christians last night by terrorists all throughout areas of Sri Lanka, many of them inside of churches. Did you know that? And I want you to know that hate has an expiration date. Hate always has an expiration date. But Jesus' love is endless. It is timeless. He will love you to the very end, even of your story, so that you and I can begin again. And let me tell you, the message of love is the message that every Christian has in our lives. It's every bit of humanity that's been touched by the love of God. And this is the message that we need to give to a lost and dying world that God's love engulfs the hate that is out there. Can I hear an amen? God's love is greater. It's relentless. It's reckless. It's who he is. It represents him. It's his character. You know, many times we keep writing our story with empty ink filled with loneliness and shame. Jesus is saying, but let me tell you, you let that ink run out because I'm going to love you to the end so that you, I can begin again with you. Begin again in your story. And, and John wants us to know as he talks about this in the last part of his gospel that, that it was all for love that Jesus did this. Everything that we have that we see comes from God's love and you understand his entire universe is the material reflection of God's love for you. When you look at the mountains today, when you look at the valleys, when you look at the trees, when you look at the grass, when you look at the flowers, it represents God's love for us. So much so that the Bible says even the unbeliever does not have an excuse because God's love is all around us in the hills and the valleys and the trees and the, and the grass and the flowers. Nobody has a reason to not understand the love of God that he has for you and for me. Wow. Wow. Sometimes we've done God a big disservice by saying God is angry all the time. That's not the God that I know in this word. In this word, oh yes, in the Old Testament, we see a God of wrath that he comes and we see that he is not happy. But Jesus Christ in the New Testament came and the story got changed where Jesus took all the wrath and sin and lies upon himself at the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, you and I are free to receive the love of God today. Amen? You know, love exists because God is. Have you ever been raptured in love? Every married person should be shaking their head yes. Yes, right? But you know, we, we, we use the word love in crazy ways. You've heard this many times. You don't have the same love for your dog as you do your children. Don't answer that, do you? <laughs> My kids last night said to me, you, you love our dog more than you love us. I do not. But let me tell you, that dog comes to my feet every time I walk in the door <laughs> and gives me a big hug. I mean, come on. Well, maybe I do love them. <laughs> you know, so much gets lost in translation, and God speaks in the language of Jesus so that we can understand wherever we go, whatever we've done, God speaks in the language of his son. And John says, this is how God showed his love amongst us, that he sent his son into the world 
This is the language of love so that we can understand that Jesus is God's declaration. Declaration that I see you, that you matter, that you have infinite value and worth. That's why he sent Jesus Christ as a visible display to come to this earth, to go through the same temptations that you and I go through, to go through and understand the pain and the grief of life, but he remains sinless for us. He has an unconditional love for you. And we realize that through it, as you look at God's word, that Jesus' love brings us life. See, everywhere you see love in the Bible, you see life come together. They're intertwined, and you can't mix those two up. They are, they are intertwined, and they come together that you and, our, uh, you and I are designed so much so that if you don't know love, then you don't know life. And people fill that vacuum all the time. And I'm willing to say there's people that are in here today that you're filling your life, that vacuum, with something else other than God's love other than the perfect love that God has for you. And we do it, oh yes, all of us have done it for sure. Trying to fill up love through fame and success or power and what happens is, is it leaves us empty. Have you ever been to a museum full of paintings? I mean, amazing paintings. You've gone in, you've taken a look at it and you're in there and you're walking around and you're like, man, I, I'm looking at this painting and I don't even know really what it means. And you're like, what, what does this mean? And thank God for you, you brought your bougie friend. And they know what all these paintings mean. And they've studied them. And, and they're saying, yeah, you know, the author of this, the one who painted this, they, this is them. And this is what this means. And, and you're standing back and you're looking at it and said, wow, I think I did something like this when I was about 10 years of age in art class. <laughs> right? Because it's like, that's a painting worth a million dollars. That's amazing. Right? It's crazy. You know, I did that in... But I, I just wonder, in our lives, is, in our lives, is, we're painting our own story. I wonder what the creator and the author thinks when we've painted the canvas and it really hasn't turned out the way that the author has designed us. Because we filled it with other things. We thought fame, we thought success, we thought this, we thought that. This will do it. And we find out it doesn't do it. The only thing that moves you from death to life is love. And the moment you know that, you know in that moment, you realize you've been captured by a relentless love. And that kind of love will change everything. But let me tell you something today. It's insanity to search for love and run from God. In the story of the prodigal son that we know so well in the New Testament, as we see this story, the son said, I want all that you have for me, all my inheritance. I will take it, Dad. I'm done here. I'm done with you. I'm done with the family. I'm going to go out and have a life of my own. I'm going to seek fame. I'm going to seek success. And so please give it to me. And the father said, okay. And you know the father didn't like that news, seeing his son go and he went away and he thought these things that would fill his life and bring, bring him success and fulfillment didn't do that. And we see in of that that he groveled, even ate with the pigs, the Bible says, that he realized in a moment that he came to his senses that he needed to go back. He needed to go back. He had an error in his ways and he needed to go back and he thought, wow, if I could just get a, a job in dad's house, if I could just go back there again, but I'm really not sure if he is going to accept me or, or care or love me any longer that you see in the story, he goes back and the father wraps his arms around him and loves him and draws him back in. And it had to be a crazy hug at that moment. While the son, he's trying to get a job, the dad is preparing a party for his boy. The Bible says that there was dancing and there was music so much so that, that the older brother could hear the dancing while he was yet in the field. Now that's some heavy duty party and if you ask me, could hear the dancing, wow. How quickly did the father go AWOL? This is my sinful son. No, he said, listen, more than that, I love him. And it was in the same night that the son came home that he threw a party and he said, son, I love you. It doesn't matter. 
you, you've come back here for a job, but I want you to know that I love you as your father and I accept you. And he said, I brought the best DJ out and it's time to party. And come on, bring out the best food that we have. And he's, this DJ is going to play your favorite song. It's love that brings you to life. That's why Jesus came. It's why he died on the cross He became the sacrifice for you and me. And God understands this, that the ultimate decision of love is sacrifice. When we're sinning, we're so busy trying to put ourselves back together again. Can I encourage you today to lean in to love and celebrate his grace towards you because God has said, listen, I love you, and I want to draw you back into a relationship with me, and I want you to come out here to the dance floor, and you thought you were going to the woodshed, but God wants to put you on the dance floor. That's an amazing God that we have. Amen? So many times we live like, oh, wow, you know what? He's just going to... He's just going to be mad at me, and he's going to talk down to me, and he's not going to love me. And, and let me tell you something. I want to just tell you something right now that, that, that I want to encourage you on, that, that God is not a hater of your life. That's not the word that I read. God loves you. Quit remembering what God has already forgiven. I've had people come up to me and say, well, God doesn't make sense. And I'm like, whoa, welcome to the party, man. Ooh, let's party. Ready to party now? I mean, yeah, wow, I agree. Like, I'm sorry. Was God supposed to make sense? I got a little pea brain mind. I don't get all that God's doing. God's not a vending machine. God is not a mathematical equation. You push his buttons and you get what you want. If that's the case, who's God? God is a mystery. Thank God he's God, right? Wow. We realize that. That's what makes him God. If you understand God, that's not God. If his, way, his ways are higher than our ways, yeah, we're not going to understand it. His love is higher than our love. God so loves is illogical. God is obsessed with bad people, even bad people who stay bad people. God loves them. God always stays in love with us. You know that God loves people in hell today? They've just made the decision to not want a relationship with God, but that doesn't change God. God says, I love them still. They've made the course in their life to go after other things and to fill the vacuum up in their life with the things that will not satisfy. But what is love without choice? Without choice, we've lost the definition of love. Our culture and our society We see that so much forced love is how you go to jail, and that's called abuse. God is not abusive. God is a God that gives every one of us a choice today. God is not abusive. So you and I can either acknowledge this obsession towards us, or we can ignore it, but it's your choice. But let me tell you this, the obsession remains God so loved. God has done everything he can to move you to life. And love is the bridge to get you out of death. That's when you open your life. You and I can go to crazy, crazy measures if we can't find somebody who wants our love. Imagine God, the source of perfect love doing everything possible to remove all the distractions, the boundaries, the walls, giving his son on the cross, waiting for us to receive the love and to love him in return. But we know that we've passed from death to life, the Bible says, because we love each other. How do you know? Because you love each other. How do you know that you've passed? How do you know you passed? You love each other. If you don't love people, you have not passed over. To love each other, then you have life. You know, it's why we do what we do here. It's why as you came in today, the cars, those people in the parking lot helping you come in, our greeters all the way through, people in places you can't even see, our kids' ministry, other areas. Why do we do this? Because God so loved. Because our lives 
have been changed by God's love. It's why we've planted a church in, in Clearbrook. It, 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 why? Because God so loves. There's a message to be gotten out. God so loves. It, it moved God to do something. It should move us to be actively involved and pursue other people and love other people that need the Lord Jesus Christ. It moves us. God's love compels us to do this. When Jesus rose from the grave out of the tomb, John ran to the tomb, the Bible says, like Peter did. The thing that John did is he stopped short from going in, the Bible tells us, but Peter ran on ahead. He's running in there, he runs on ahead, and he goes in there to see Jesus is not there. I I would encourage you, may you get the courage to go in today and to come out alive. To go into the tomb and die to the things that need to die and come out alive when you walk in into the love that God has for you, you enter into the love that casts out all fear today. Is there fear in your life? That means there's not perfect love because the Bible says perfect love casts out fear. It is gone. It cannot stay inside of that. Kristen and I had the opportunity last month to go to Israel. It was our first time. What an amazing opportunity that we had to go And as we went, we got to see many sites that were there, but one of the most impacting was the tomb where Jesus was buried. It was the tomb that Joseph of Arimathea gave and put it on loan and said, you can put his body inside of there, and there are pictures that are behind me that show the outside of that tomb. But as Kristen and I entered in, we looked in, and I'm going to tell you today, Jesus is no longer there. I'm an eyewitness to the fact that he is risen, and he's alive in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ needs to celebrate the fact that he is no longer there, but he is risen. Amen? Amen. Just like the gospel writers were witnesses to the fact Jesus is no longer in the tomb. He has risen. He has risen. What are we saying? The cross equals love. The love of God was expressed on the cross, and Jesus is the fullest revelation of God that has come to wrap his arms around you today and to draw you in, to draw you in. You know, everything in Christianity rests on a single event, and that is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you, for the small gods in your life, did they die for you? Have they filled the void? Like Jesus can? Are you giving your life to something that is not reciprocated? 